What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats on the Out of Collective Network. I'm sitting here with Jeremy Powers. I'm like kind of like like almost fangirling a little bit because, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, my 300 pound self was like wanting to get into cycling. And I ended up watching Behind the Barriers and uh, was like, oh, I should get into cyclocross. I did one cyclocross race. That was the furthest I ever got. Um, but found myself in other cycling adventures and other media adventures. But anyways, Jeremy has a long, I mean, all the way from BMX, yeah, you BMX to freaking road uh, results <laughs> that is on your Wikipedia page. And it's like, honestly, there's like a third page to this Wikipedia page with the amount of results you have. But other than that, Jeremy, how you doing, dude? Uh, I'm doing good. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here. It's uh yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. The Wikipedia, isn't it? I, I, yeah. I haven't figured out how to deal with that. It's, it seems like it's every once in a blue moon, it comes up with some, something like this. And I'm like, I gotta get into that thing. It's just a disaster in there. Do who, so see, I've always wondered this, who, because mine popped up right after Pan Am's, like I got a Wikipedia and I thought I was the coolest dude in the world. Um, and, but like some of the stuff that was said in there, I was like, man, I don't they had me lighter than I am, which is pretty awesome. I was, I was okay with that. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like BMX, man, like when did your Wikipedia page start? Were you like 12? Like, I mean, <laughs> you were doing junior oh. races. In BMX. Stuff. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say I would I probably like, probably someone started it, you know, after some result and cause that's what was like cool in you yeah. know, 1987 or something like that, or 2002 or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then it kind of, they grow from there and then someone takes it to a whole nother level. There were some people over the years that I, I know like were big, you know, they, they really followed along and they wanted to keep a good record yeah. of things. I, I was always grateful for that. And, um, but, um, it might it, it needs a haircut. I can tell you that. I, I can't yeah. tell you that I have a lot of time to be spending on on doing that. That's why it's not been trimmed up. Yeah, but it's, it, in, uh, it's intense. It's intense. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. in depth. Like, I mean, you have separate sections for Rafa focus. I mean, you have a before your career started early career, like before jelly belly, like you're like, this is in depth. But anyways, Jeremy, tell me a little bit about you for like, because this is like a ski podcast. There's like, um ultra runners that listen to this podcast so some people might not even know who you are mainly we have cyclists but uh let's dive into like a little bit about you and how you even find yourself in the cycling world yeah um well i mean the short the short story is is that i was a young kid from connecticut with a lot of energy um i was and still am you know i still have like a proper yeah. case of add and my <laughs> my mom was putting me into a lot of sports to try yeah. to figure out how i could get that energy out and um, I found a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, excitement on the bike. <laughs> I really enjoyed the riding, yeah. enjoyed the individualism of it um, and being able to kind of control uh, and, and also get that energy that I had inside of me out. And there's no better way yeah. to do it than to be on the bike. And yeah, it immediately was something that I just couldn't live without. I loved it so much uh, when I was young. I just I loved getting on my bike and that sense of freedom and ripping around. And then the racing came after that. But it was never the, the main it was never the real thing. It wasn't, I have to be a yeah. bike racer. It was, I really enjoyed just riding my bike. Yeah. And so like, I guess my thing is, is like with all the different disciplines you did, I mean, you know, it's kind of like you really started to take it serious, like around college. Like, I mean, I guess it was serious, but like you dove into the road, you're signing a pro road contract with Jelly Belly. Right. And around the college time frame, Um, and so what like what was it hard to balance those two like with cycle cross and and pro road racing because pro road racing back then too was like very they were very strict it's like you know you're doing this but i guess the seasons kind of intertwined pretty well yeah yeah man back in the day um you know there was when i was a junior it was it was mountain biking and then you know after mountain biking um i got mononucleosis and um yeah. uh, i didn't end up turning pro um, well, I did turn, I turned pro mountain biking, but it wasn't really yeah. the, the way that I was going to be able to make a living moving forward. So then, um, I moved up here to Western Massachusetts and with my mom, maybe after, I don't know, like a month of looking at colleges very quickly, I wasn't going to go to college, yeah. but, um, after I got sick with mono that last summer of mountain biking, um, as a junior, uh, we quickly realized like, Hey, I, I probably need to go to school cause I'm not going to be turning pro and traveling all over the globe. And, um, that turned into me moving to where I live now, which is here in Massachusetts in Western Massachusetts. Yeah. 
yeah. linked in with a cycling community that was really heavily influenced by a lot of pro road riders. And so yeah. that's what turned me into, um, and on to, to, to the racing on the road. And then ultimately to a contract with jelly belly at the end of that year, I went from like a, I think the story is like a cat five to a, to a, to a tour or to a one. And then I was already, um, really into it. Like I was super into yeah. road racing at that point. Like, okay. Everyone's racing yeah. road. This is super fun. <laughs> and then, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Jelly belly, Danny Van Hout came knocking and, um, and then I was on the national team doing some events in Europe and cyclocross kind of followed along with that. I was always doing cyclocross, um, in the background, but, um, but yeah, then my aspirations for, for cross grew and, um, yeah, it was kind of the classic, like if you want to do cross, you need to have a road contract to pay for it. So, yeah. um, you know, Mark McCormick had set that example early on. Todd Wells had done it on the mountain bike, Barry Wicks, um, Jackson Stewart. Uh, Adam Craig, like all of these mountain bikers and road riders would kind of meet in the cross fields. And um, yeah. I just followed that example that was set, you know, Tim Johnson, probably the closest to me in age, Ryan Trevon, those are my good rivalries. And those guys were on both sides of the coin, kind of doing it in their disciplines, Tim on the road and Ryan and mountain. Was it hard to find that balance though? Like, I mean, cause like even nowadays, like it's becoming so specialized, like, and I mean, even towards the tail end of your career, I think it, I think it was getting specialized. And I think honestly, think and you know not to toot your own horn but it's like when the media stuff came like and cyclocross got bigger i think more money got pumped into cyclocross so like people were able to kind of actually put focus into their careers and i could be wrong i don't it's no, cycling right. right so like there it makes it like focus into their careers and being called pro is you know you being getting paid five grand it's not like you're making a crazy living but it's just it's different right um yeah. but anyways like how, was it hard to make that balance like you know, I mean, I know that the two, the two are kind of different seasons and they're kind of done like roads done by the time you're kind of really taking off in cyclocross and then cyclocross kind of dies out and then boom, you're back in the road. But was it like, I mean, just the rest alone and the travel and families and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, it's not one size fits all, is it right? You can see yeah. that like right now in a, you know, 2022, um, like Pidcock, Vanderpool, and, and, you know, those guys can kind of mix the disciplines and jump in and out of things. Then you've got like more of a traditionalist, which is like Van Ayer, yeah. right? Where he just tears it up on the road and then he comes in across. Um, so I don't think it's, 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 you know, one size fits all or that there is a formula that works for everyone. You see Magalie Rochette this year went to try for mountain bike again, pretty hard and, you know, decided, Hey, this is going to be too much for me. I need to pull the reins back. You see it you know, Leah Davison, I just saw, uh, said something along the lines of like, she was, um, she really doesn't, she doesn't think she likes gravel. Like I'm out. You know what I mean? She was, yeah. she was taking a stab at it. And I think she, I just read something on her Instagram the other day where she's like, Hey, like, I'm not going to be at, you know, lead boat or whatever. I just, it's not my thing anymore. I'm like going to go back to yeah. mountain bike and doing these longer endurance events. So I think you got to follow where your heart is. I think you need to, to look at what's, um, you know, what's out there, what's possible and what's your skill set match to. I think for me, you know, road racing was so, so I, I gained so much from my motor, you know what I mean? Those yeah. long endurance miles and things like that. And then moving over to, um, and then moving to cyclocross in the winter was a nice balance. I, I found it to be, you know, some years it was really stressful with a lot of racing, but other years it was, yeah, it was really, 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 really good when I got a more balanced schedule and I grew a little bit when you're young, they race you in absolutely everything. And as I grew, yeah. I got to, I got to, uh, kind I got pick to pick a little bit more schedule yeah yeah no and, and and yeah so like like i was talking about like before we even started recording like um i think one of the coolest things is like you're one of like the first like i would say one of the first privateers like in it in a discipline right like you you kind of started that rafa you know focus team and and you did the behind the barrier like you had a niche to keep this team going to where you could do what you love to do and then and it was all something you love to do so how did that idea even come about like because you know, it's, it's not very easy to put together. And I can only imagine how hard that was to put together back then when it wasn't mm. that popular and those ideas, it was just a free flowing idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. Content, um, content was always behind the barriers was my day in the life show that I had, um, that, um, you know, for anyone that is like a skier, that's just coming in. <laughs> yeah. It was like this weird, you know what I mean? Is is this just day in the life show that I had started a, the year before I tried to do it with like a self, like a, a, a selfie stick and a camera <laughs> before yeah. this is like 2000 and this would have been like 2008. You know what I mean? This is yeah. early days. Like YouTube's YouTube's not even really a big 
deal. Like if you're on YouTube, you're on YouTube. Cool. But like, it's not, I don't know. I, I, I just, I remember looking at YouTube in 2005 and six and thinking this is dumb. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I wasn't totally sold on YouTube as a, as a, as a platform. In fact, we used Vimeo for most of behind the barriers at that time. Cause it was, a, it was, it, 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 it um, rendered nicer. It was easier to share. Um, and I, yeah. I was able to do more with it. I was able to put sponsor logos on top of the videos and we were able to monetize those sponsorships, even in an organic way, uh, versus like, you know, saying, Oh, we have to have like a 15 second pre-roll advertisement on YouTube or something like that. So there were yeah. reasons for all of the the decisions, but, um, you know, I, I, the, the question was like, how did we, how did we balance it or what happened with it is like, Behind the barriers was just uh, it was what I think I had to do, you know. Cyclocross yeah. at the time was very very small, and we needed to be able to showcase the sport. And I realized so much more as I got into it that my weird extroverted personality would allow me to just feel like no no real pressure from doing that, from <laughs> yeah. being that from being that microphone okay. and to being that guy that rolled up on someone's like, hey, how, how how are you doing? How's it going? What are you what are you yeah. doing? Why are you here? How how are you feeling? What's going on? And so I think that that just was a natural extension of who I am and what I really enjoy about the cycling community. And through that show, you know, we were able to really tell a lot of beautiful stories of people that were in it then that went on to become big champions and some that, you know, some that didn't, some that were just passerbys. And, you know, they yeah. came in and they came out as quickly as they came in. And but um, but we, you know, through that, it, it the central theme was always my racing. And actually the story, the the, the videos were there before I got like. I'd say before I really hit my, my peak of my run. And, yeah. um, that was kind of, that was kind of sweet because, um, people got to follow that, that climb. And that's what ultimately, you know, led to, I think a successful show because they got to see the, the ins and the outs, the hard, the hard parts and the good parts. Um, and they got to follow along with someone that was always kind of figuring it out as they went along also. So behind the barriers was a really fun project. It changed my life for sure. And in fact, you know, it's still there for me to go back and look at and humble myself yeah. with about how, you know, a 20, a 24 or 25 year old version of myself uh, looked at the world. So it's it's good in that way, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think it's just like because I've tried to do the vlogging and, you know, everybody wants to start a YouTube channel, especially nowadays. Right. Like everybody wants to start a vlog channel. Everybody wants to do this because they they've realized that there's money in it. Like there's sure. like there's next level money in this like content and whatever else. But when you're trying to race train 20 plus hours a week, you know, live a normal life, like at home, like the last thing you want to do is just be talking into a camera and then editing this film and then putting it all together. And so like for me, where I was like highly impressed is not only were you putting this content together and, and you had the help of, what was it Sam? I believe. Yeah. 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 Sam so Sam. like, yeah. So Sam Smith came in and helped, helped kind of put some of that stuff together. But like this, this had never been really done then especially in the cycling space. Like there was, there was definitely like the internet vloggers, but um, especially, but for like a good, you know, a pro level athlete, there was nobody being really followed around. And I mean, I talked to one of the United healthcare guys, supposedly they tried to do it with these like little selfie cameras and things. And he said, yeah, it was an epic fail. Like we could, just couldn't do it. Like there's so much we had to cut out because we were saying stupid shit and, and like all yeah. kinds of stuff. So I guess, I guess my thing is, is like, when did, um, you know, like wh why did, I guess, why did it stop and why didn't you think to carry it on? Like, cause I felt like, I feel, I feel like a behind the barriers in a now world would be insane. Like it mm. would be, it would almost be like people would pay to watch it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. That's a great question. I, I wonder, I, I felt like at, um, when I was racing, the reason that we stopped was, uh, was, was a little bit easier to get your head around. I think it was that I felt as though the stories that I had to tell of my own were yeah. over. Um, and I felt like the, I felt like there was, there was already a lot of, um, I don't know, this is going to sound weird to people that don't know me. There's already a lot of like, Jeremy. <laughs> um, yeah, th there was already a lot of promotion of my, my, my name and of what I was doing. And actually, I felt like it was an over promotion. Um, I don't know that I would change my opinion of it either. I felt like there was a there was a time when I was overhyped and um, I needed to focus on my racing and I wanted mm -hmm. to be a better, like more well rounded thing that didn't just where, where the world didn't just revolve around me. Cycling is often so insular not to get too deep or weird. But it is so. No, yeah, this uh, whole point of this podcast, dude. <laughs> you, have to, you have to look out for yourself so much, yeah, yeah. and you can get so in your own head. Like you, 
you, you really can think your stuff doesn't stink. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I felt like that was, that was, ah, yeah, everything being on camera all the time. And I just, I, there, there was this shift between wanting to make it. And then I had, yeah. I had like made it right. I was making a good, a good enough living. I was happy and I was in a yeah. great place. And the thing that I didn't have was the championships that like really, you know, backed up that, that what I wanted in my career. So, yeah. you know, I, I was able to focus more on that um, and focus on the world cup racing and focus on, you know, being a, 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 a jack of one trade. This is something we also talked yeah, about yeah. Before, uh, before the show started. It's like, I had to focus on being a pro cyclist and let the, um, the part go away. And, th and the other thing that I'd say that is, is an inevitable reality is that, the ability to do this type of content in an Instagram and a social media environment really got a lot easier in 2000. And, yeah. You know, in yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I just thought it was, like, yeah, it, it didn't even exist. And so my my ability to tell my story to the people that wanted to hear it um, was was infinitely easier than when we had started the show, which was the whole point is like, can someone that's interested get a glimpse into this thing? And can we grow the sport through it? And as if you watch the progression of the show, you'd notice that actually in the last seasons, it, it changed away from just being about me. Oftentimes yeah. we would go and do a, a piece with Adam Craig, or we'd go with Anthony Clark or one of these other personalities that was in the sport to understand what their life behind the barriers, right. Was like, well, you and almost created like, characters as well. Like you gave that's, these that's what we were people trying. a box. Trying to build up, was, trying to build up the sport. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, but I could also see it near the tail end of your career and don't take this the wrong way either, but it's like, Near the end of the career, I could almost see like you were upset, like you were bummed. Like it was kind of like, you know, like you could tell it was kind of coming to an end and you were ready to kind of hang it up. And like, did you feel that? Like, because I mean, like literally, I remember watching Cycle Cross Nationals. I was like, oh, that's his last national championship. And he knows this is <laughs> a lot. You know what I mean? Like, and I know that sounds really weird, but like it was almost it was a different Jeremy than I was used to seeing on, on video. But it, yeah. I could tell that you were just emotional, you know? Like, I did think you feel that at all? Racing racing's a weird thing. You know, you, you do it and, um, it brought a lot of beautiful, a lot of beautiful memories to my, you know, to my life. Yeah. I have such great, mo mainly only good ones, but as I got older, you know, I'm, I'm 39 now. So the, I'm not a spring chicken. And, <laughs> right and when you saw, when you saw me in those last years, I was, I was quite old for a cyclocrosser, you know, 34, yeah. 35, trying to race with, you know, gauge hacked uh, at, at 20 or 21 or 22. And these guys, yeah. it was, um, yeah, I mean, and even Vanderpool and, and Van Air, you know, they were still very much racing when I was doing this. Yeah. this it became it became very clear that like my my time was was going to come to an end. It was the next generation of cross riders after Wellens and Nace, and you know these guys had had left, and I was still there. It was it was infinitely harder to to see the front of the international races where I had often been in the top ten, and it became clear that like you know Stephen uh, Hyde was very very strong. Um, he was kind of heir apparent, and I'd say I had a heart. Thing happened at the 20 i think it was 2016 uh pan am championships where my heart raced yeah. like really high during the middle of the race and i had to drop out in a nice duel with hyde and um that sort of set me in a different way and i also at that time had signed um ellen noble and then the next year i went on to sign spencer petrov and my focus was always to kind of switch the team from just being about me to spin down my career and then to focus more on building the team and having a premier, you know, uh, American based European result driven cyclocross team and with a yeah. media arm and to do these things. But um, kind of all in one felt swoop, you know, I got second at that Reno, that Reno Nationals uh, to hide. It was a great battle. I really that felt like a good comeback from the kind of the miss on the season otherwise because of the heart stuff. I came back. I did a really good race there. I did the next season. I was on the podium a bit, but that um in the probably november we got a lot of word that you know focus would stop that rafa was going to change directions and that would leave me with a really like almost a, a huge significant uh decrease in budget overall and it was going to yeah. be for where i was given like what you see maybe from a motivation standpoint you know it was going to be really hard to recoup that it takes as you can see from from sponsorship no, land sure. it takes months if not years to build those relationships to get those to come in and um, with balancing the racing, it just didn't, it wasn't going to be possible for me to, to continue to hold the team up. And also you kind of balance that with leaving sport as a, as a pro yeah. rider. It's so there's, there's some that do it really, really well. I think, you know, I got the opportunity with GCN shortly after that. And that was like, 
Hey, I don't, I'm not running from my problems. Um, I just, uh, I had been working on transitioning out for a long time and this was a clean exit for me and a really cool opportunity where I was going to be able to still, you know, put my skills of being in front of a camera and working yeah. with athletes and t- storytelling, um, to work and step away from kind of the hardships and the mental drain that racing can take on you if you're not like thriving. Yeah, I think, well, and that's, that's the thing I think, and, and I'd love for you to kind of chat on this a little bit, cause I know we have young dudes that listen to this podcast, young girls that listen to this podcast who, um, who are in the sport and, and are trying to go to the top, 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 highest level. And like, you've won several national championships. You've won Pan Am championships. You've been a part of world cups. Like you've won a lot of bike races. And, um, the crazy thing is, and I've, you know, I've won a, like a one sixteenth of the amount of races you've won. And, but even every national championship I've ever won, I've always wanted more, you know, and you, you get that hype that you always want more. And it's like, when does it end? Right? Like, do you go to the Olympics? And it's like, I want more, you know, you just want more, you want more, you want more. And you hear about this, like blues of just like this constant. And like, it's always funny. Like, cause when somebody asks me when, you know, you pull away from the sport or whatever, it's like, is there something that you wish you could, you could have changed or you could have gotten more. And it's like, I feel like I always could have wanted more. Like, do you kind of feel like that? Or like, was it kind of like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's just that like feeling of like coming to terms with like, Hey, this is the successes I had. These are the memories I had. Um, and, and honestly yeah. I wouldn't trade them for the world. Like, I mean, yeah, I maybe would have wanted to win Pan Ams or do this differently, but even then, like, uh, the fact that I even got to go, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, you can always, you can always look back and think there was more on the table for you to take. Um, or if this thing had gone this way, or if I had done this differently, there would have been another opportunity. Um, yeah. or something maybe was a different outcome. I made plenty of bad decisions too, you know, training camps that went, you know, to hell in a hand basket. Like, yeah, yeah, we got rained out. We got sick. You know, it was just, you, know, you just throw away a month in the middle of a pretty critical point in your career. It's tough. But despite all of it, you know, despite the injuries, because there were plenty of them, you know, you still when when it counted to make it right and to make it happen, you did. And I think that yeah. I can only I can only look back at that with being a North American where cycling is not the like absolute top priority of like society, whereas in Europe, it's, yeah. you know what I mean? There's so many more resources and trainers and focus points. I look at, you know, being with the situation in the hand that I was dealt. I was really performance driven and I got the absolute best people around me that I could to help me make good decisions, to help coach me, to look over my, you know, my body. Um, yeah. Look over my logistics, manage and take care of contracts and meet obligations that athletes have. And also to allow me to be able to make the sacrifice to be my best. Right. That's the thing is it yeah. takes so much dedication to be at the top. So with that, is there anything on the table? I would have really loved to have podium to world cup. It's something that I think was absolutely possible with the right scenario um, with the right track, if the focus, um, you know, I tried, I got really close at Vegas. I ended up sixth place, uh, at the world cup that was there. And, um, I think it, I was looking at the podium, you know, it was absolutely possible in the right scenario with the right, um, you know, amount of luck. And I, uh, I regret that, but I don't, um, it, you know, you were talking about Phil Guy before the show used to have a, he used to have a podcast. Um, and it always talked about like, kind of, you know, if, if, if you're at the top of the sport, you know what I mean? Yeah. How can, how much more can you get to? And it's like at the top yeah. of the sport, it turns out that everyone that you're racing against is already a world champion is already top five in the world. You know, the, 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 the talent is very, very high at that level. And you might yeah. have to, you might have to just be like where you are. This is, this may be where I am. Sixth place might be the pinnacle of my level uh, or what I can do. It's not to say that if you keep trying, you won't get there, but um, I have to be happy with what I did get. There becomes a crossroad. There becomes a crossroad. Yeah. And, and so how did you, oh, how did you come to terms Phil's with podcast that? Though? We need to Google that. Phil Gaiman's podcast. It was like I don't, the, I'm not, I'm not Joe Rogan. So I don't have like a little crone to just be like, yo, Google that real quick. See where <laughs> we, need, we need this. Yeah. We need that. Uh, real talent. And that was, that was it. Real, real talent. talent. Because the thing is, is that at some point you do get to that. Like if you're at the pointy end of the, of the stick, you're like, Hey, we're talking about guys that got real talent up here or, you know, in a case, yeah. of, of, you know, I think these are the best women in the world. Or these are the best guys in the world. And there's not a whole lot that I'm going to be able to do to change that, except for continue to grab, you know, a percent here and a percent there while they're growing as well. It's really, really hard at the top. Um, there's not a lot of room for, you know, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of room up there. It's, it's, uh, yeah. 
it's hard. It's a it, it is a it is a different beast. And then like learning how to manage it, like when you especially when you experience it for the first time and you just go get your teeth kicked in or you just get completely rocked. It's like how to manage that, how to go home and be like, OK, well, what, like I thought I was training like a madman. <laughs> and I guess I guess I wasn't. And so it's like this is like learn of, uh, of how to handle that. But anyways, so. Yeah, so you've, you know, at this point, you finished your career, you know, you're doing the transition, and then you find yourself at GCN. And uh, how did that come about, even? In 2016, like, did they reach you, out to you? Or did you throw a resume yeah. in or what? Yeah, in 2016, if you um, Google the like the Zolder World Championships, you'd see like a YouTube video of me going around the track with uh, Matt Stevens, I think Dan Lloyd, um, and and the crew were there. I think Sai was there too. Well, anyway, we, we yeah. tore it up. We went around, we ripped it up. We were looking at the track um, and we had a blast. We were like laughing a ton. And over the years I had, I think they definitely knew if you were in like cycling, you know, uh, video land, then you definitely probably knew of my show. And I think they watched yeah. it and they probably knew where I was, where I was at in my, the way that I held myself on camera, et cetera. So they were like, he would, you know, probably be a good, probably a good fit. So Simon Richardson yeah. uh, had reached out. Um, and then another gentleman that works there, Mike, um, had reached out to me and asked me to come over and to do a, a show uh, with them. Just straight up, like no, no talk about anything. No talk about about business, about like doing presenting or anything. Just come over and and come to GCN and let's do a let's do like a a great ride over here. Okay, no problem. So I went yeah. over and I did like the most uh, British ride or something like this, uh, which was cool. Me and Cy went through like the English countryside, went down to, uh, it's like one of the state forests there and had a beautiful day of riding. And then they asked me if I would host a show and they recorded it and they saw how I hosted the show and did like a Q and a with people. And then before I left, they made me an offer for a job, which was, uh, which wow. was very flattering yeah, and cool. cool. And, um, yeah, and it was, it was kind of everything that I was, I thought it would be, it was just really, I had always had this idea that I would go into a dear, I would, my, my goal when I finished, if I wasn't going to own a team, and even if I did own a team was to be as good at it as I was as a bike racer, right? Like I want to hold up yeah. myself to a high standard and I'm still extremely passionate and driven about whatever it is that I put my mind to. Um, and, um, with, with, with GCN, it was of course no different. I brought that mindset and those skills that I learned from racing over to the content. I took the job. I spun the team down. I spun my sponsorships down. Um, and, um, I went full, full stick with GCN for two years. Yeah. And then, and then, so then we find you at whoop, which if you guys aren't familiar with whoop, it's that <laughs> wristband, or I guess you got bicep bands now too. Um, yeah, you can but wear it. You can wear it on your bicep. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's essentially, you know, tracks your sleep, tracks your HRV. Um, how'd you find fall yourself into that? And like, what are you doing over there? <laughs> well, um, you know, GCN was awesome, but during the pandemic, it became really challenging to, to go to events. Of course, naturally, everyone yeah. knows this, um, to be kind of doing the work that I would do, right. I'm like talking to people and doing interviews yeah. and hanging out and, um, you know, this, this became a lot. And then also even having a videographer here in the studio was impossible. You know, how am I going to get someone to come in and to shoot me when they've got to have like 14 masks on and everyone's freaked out about, yep. Oh, it was a disaster. So when the opportunity to, I had a friend that had worked at whoop, um, and we went out on a long ride and he had mentioned that they were going to be hiring for a role that looked over kind of the endurance and cycling category. And, um, I, I just inquired. So like, what, 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 you know, what are you guys thinking? <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's sort of how it got. That's how the ball, ball got rolling. Um, I, I would, it was interesting because on one side of the coin, it's like, but why you like had this, you know, this thing with GCN and, yeah, yeah. and Euros. Really cool. And then on the other side, it's like, but this is a more traditional job. And um, I also have now two, two children. So at the end of my career, yeah. we had my son. And then during the pandemic, we had my, my little girl. And things um, for me, you know, that that kind of busy being on the road so much, um, you know, doing a VO under a cover while they're sleeping, uh, you know, trying to knock out work after they're gone, that 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 became it became a little bit harder to juggle, especially during the pandemic with less child care and things available. So for these reasons, a uh, more traditional style uh, marketing and athlete management, sports marketing type job became like mm, this could be a good fit for me. And equally, you know, when I look at my my whole like 
career, <laughs> I think of yeah. myself as an athlete. I, I think on, you know, working on behalf of uh, the brands in a, as an athlete and sponsor, you know, sponsored athlete kind of role. And then when I think about GCN, you know, you're often working on behalf of the sponsor in this way. And then now at, at, um, at Whoop, I'm, I'm working on behalf of the brand. So I think it's like kind of a well-rounded um, bit to be able to see kind of all sides of the table and what's important to them and how they operate. And it's given me great, uh, great insight into like how sports marketing, how marketing, how partnerships really work, what makes them successful, what doesn't, how they look at, you know, a company like this would look at something like a GCN or like a sponsorship or commercials or athletes. It, it's just given me an enormous amount of experience. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity because I think, sometimes in cycling, after you have this career, you do have a resume that means a lot to other cyclists and to other people in the industry, but it's often hard to translate what those skills can be in the outside into the real world. You know, much, um, cyclists, yeah. like we talked earlier are, are often so all athletes are, so they have to be yeah. insular. They have to be really, really ego driven in order to be successful normally. And, um, that, uh, that can be hard on a resume. It's like, Hey, I won the world championships. It's like, Great. Can you respond to emails? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's crazy to think like it's crazy to think like how much like honestly cycling created business for me. Like I learned business, like I learned how to create an LLC. I learned how to create like, you, um, you know, like I learned how to create a sponsorship deck. I learned how to create decks. I learned how to create these things, you know, in media. I learned how to create like do copywriting stuff. So you learn all these things through cycling and and um some of these athletes like don't even realize it. Like some of the stuff that they're learning, like, you know, how to talk to sponsors, how to talk to people, how to put their best foot forward, how to follow a contract, even. I mean, not that that's like a crazy skill set, but you would shock you, like how you could put some of this stuff together and, and lay it out. Um, but yeah, so I, like when you said that to me, when you were like sports marketing, I was like, dude, but you could literally unload your whatever, you know, the last 10 years of your career into a resume and just take the cycling bit out of it. Like, okay, created, you know, I think there it's literally in your Wikipedia where it's like, yeah, I designed a show that had 80,000 fans and went to 400,000 fans in this amount of time. Like that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that, yeah. That's pretty impressive dude. In a month. Yeah, it was, was it really that, yeah, four, was it really uh, that ten quick? Months. 10 months. Yeah. 10 months. Oh, I thought you said a month. So yeah, in which, my mind one time someone, someone sent me like a, a woman watching it in like a, sh a store in, um, in India, they were there on a trip and I remember someone sending it to me and I just like co totally blew my mind. You know what I mean? That like people yeah. in India were watching behind the barriers was just, I don't know, in 2009 or 10 or whatever it was, it was just like, you know, it's totally nuts yeah. to me still that people, people followed the show, but it was cool that, and it's, I mean, it still is. You know, nowadays, like the, the show is so old that when you go and talk to the kids, like I was just up at Jeff Proctor's cyclocross camp in Vermont uh, this past week. And like, you know, the kids that are 13 getting into the sport, they weren't even born when that show was being made. So they don't know it and they're not going yeah. to, which this is great. It's like, yeah. it's just what it is. Yeah. Well, they might end up finding it, stumbling across it. You never know. <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> the the thing is, is like, um, you know, like, you know, the uh, the fan mail, like you, I, the cards, the rider cards. I remember. Like that was kind of a big hit then. Are you still getting those in your mail? Like, do you get any? Like, do thing? I send them out? No, like, do you get them? Because like, you know how people get mailed, like pictures oh, yes. of themselves and you have, I have to a, sign them. I have a, yeah. Or you don't have, have to, but. <laughs> I have a PO, I have a PO box where things like that go to and I ask them to send a self-addressed uh, envelope or, or, or package. And yes, I still have that. So yes, that still happens where people send things and I sign them and that goes back. Yes. <laughs> Okay, there you go, guys. So, Not every day of the week. Up. I won't I'll lie. The, the, blow up, the blow up that PO box considerably, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, but but I I deal. I still I'm I'm a people. You know, I'm a people person. So if someone asks me, yeah. I mean, what what does that take me? Five minutes of my time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Come on, For this sure. is nothing. And um, if if I was you know if I was so lucky to be able to inspire someone to feel something, uh, whatever that is. And they want something to remember that by that, you know, you, you're, you're damn right. You got my time for that. I'm, I'm super happy. <laughs> to that out. Hell yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, I'm really interested about this last question I have for you and, and I kind of wish I prepped you for it, but I didn't. Um, yeah. and, and it's okay. Take your time. If you want to think on it, I can cut and okay. I can edit. Um, if you could have a cup of coffee with mm -hmm. one individual dead or alive, who would that individual be? And then how would you take your coffee? Hmm. Uh, well, this is kind of a weird one. I've got, I've got a couple things. Um, maybe it's, it's weird. 
So one thing that, um, that was super inspiring to me, and I've said this on other podcasts was, um, so, so I've listened to a ton of music when I was training. I never, I don't think I ever really lived like when I was a young rider, I never went to like prom. I didn't go to any of these things that young kids did. And I gave up a ton of that to make it in racing. I was like so dedicated yeah. to the thing. I loved it. And I just wanted to keep doing it. And those things weren't, they didn't feel like sacrifices then. But then at some point you're like, man, I wish I probably should have done that. That would have been like a good. Dude, you would like, have busted down prom. You would have busted it down. <laughs> it would have been a good social thing to have done that, to like have taken a girl friend or a friend or yeah. whatever to, to, you know, to this event and um, to have experienced that. And like, you know, that wasn't the only thing that, you know, that got yeah. missed. Like graduation didn't happen. I mean, a lot of things just got like, poof, you didn't do graduation because we're going through. No, I, I mean, you know, you just you're racing. This is just racing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like college, graduate college. That didn't happen when we, we were racing. My we were, mom would have we killed making, me, dude. We were making money not care we were about living the dream, and we were traveling. I mean, it was like Amgen tour of California and trip to Cuba or like go finish the last year of college. It's like, no, we're not doing that. Like college <laughs> is now on the road and college is learned by, you know, each cup of coffee before the stage. Like this is, this is the life. This is the Send me my diploma in an email. <laughs> um, but so I listened. So that's all to say that I listened to an enormous, an enormous, like truly I listened to so much music, which later turned into podcasts as those grew in popularity. I listened to hundreds of thousands of hours of music and sets, yeah. live sets. Um, I was really into electronic music, but I really loved um, DJ AM. It was weird. He, I've said this in other podcasts. I know it's probably like, man, that's like no one. That's like not even in a game. But yeah. he inspired me to get a pair of turntables. And he, the thing that I'd say like overarchingly about me is that I'm a big fan of like, Michael Jordan level talent, right? People yeah. that have more talent in one finger than anybody else that you've ever met. They're just, they're clearly, they were given a gift. That gift is put on display and they change the world by yeah. doing it. I can put a ton of people in this bucket. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, you could, you could say it about, I, I could go on. I won't. Point being is that DJ AM, I was always really inspired by how amazing he could blend genres, how quickly he could think of the right song to put in the mix how ambidextrous he was between switching through things. And at the time with his tools that he had, they were very limited. But when a, um, a computer program called Serato came out, it digitized yeah. vinyl. And by doing that, it meant that DJs didn't any longer have to bring like cases of records with them to be able to mix them. Yeah. It opened the opportunity for him to blend genres, meaning like an 80s track with a hip hop track. And there's truly no one there's maybe like a handful of guys that have even come close to like reaching that level. Now there's like, there's some really talented DJs out there. Um, but I always wished that I had gotten to go to a DA, DJ AM show. And I would have loved to have met that guy because you know, whether or not he had something, he always would say ego is the enemy. That's actually his quote. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that have picked this up and made it their own, but that's, that's actually his, that's his quote. And I think that um, I took a lot from that. I listened to a ton of DJ AM sets and I, I rocked with those. And um, there's still, you know, even once in a blue moon, I'll still listen to them, but way ahead of his time. Um, unfortunately, he like like many musicians, he had a uh, he had an addiction problem that he I think was I think he he did like maybe 20 years uh, and then relapsed. It was really sad. Oh, and, uh, savage. Yeah. But if you recall, he also had like a he got in like a, a plane crash with Travis Barker. Everyone, everyone. Uh, oh, he was it, in that. But he and Travis Barker made it. And, um, oh, wow. and I think that that kind of combined with, you know, some other stuff that was maybe unresolved. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, but long story short, not to end on a negative, I would have loved <laughs> to have had a cup of coffee with that guy and, um, yeah. his, his talent, um, for me, it was like, there will be no, there will be no other, there just won't. It's There's just, no other. he is, right he's on. like a legend of DJing and, you know, I'm a, I always would say like, I'm a huge fan of other things. So I try to always put myself in those shoes when I think about someone sending a thing in the PO box, like, yo, I'm going to go cool. Like if you're a fan of that, if you're a fan of this and I yeah. was that guy, like, I would give you that time. And um, I was always a fan of like the people that were DJing because you can't, DJing is like a thing that you can grow on and you can make like cool, just like playing a guitar. Dude, or any I, other I thing. went to your, I went to your set in Asheville, man. I saw you, okay. I saw you DJ. All right. <laughs> There you go. So Louis, Louis, I, Louisville or, or Asheville? I was in Asheville, man. Okay. I actually, right. I helped. I got college credit to help program that phone party. I forget the girl's name, but I was in college. Right. 
Okay. And I needed, I needed, <laughs> I needed, I needed college credit for event planning. And she was like, yeah, you can intern with me. And I just did that. And yeah, that's, amazing. that's where I was. At. Yeah. <laughs> Small world. Kind of things, but that's where it all started from. So if I could have, co- if I could have coffee with one person, um, yeah. you know, it would probably be that. I know people were probably thinking like, you know, like some, some president or something like that. No, it's just, nah, just, yeah. I, I'm, no, I'm I think just, that's, that's why this question is so cool. But how would you take your coffee? My coffee would absolutely, it, it would have to be, um, yeah, I am, I am quite particular about the coffee. Um, yeah. and it would have to be, it would have to be black. I, I do have a dash of cream in it, uh, these days just because, um, you know, it's just how, it's just the way that the world's working at the moment in my little brain. But, um, but normally for, for most of my life, it was like, I drank my coffee black, but it couldn't be, you know, just some store-bought coffee or something like that. It had to be kind of weighing that shit out and. No, no, no. I never waited, but my buddy, my buddy Makunda uh, owns a coffee yeah. like roasting company here. And he taught me a lot about coffee when I was a young buck and I, I've not forgotten those things. So unfortunately, yeah. like once, you know, it's impossible yeah. to go back. You're like, for sure. I can't, I can't. I mean, I'm like everyone. I've had plenty of Dunkin' Donuts, but uh, I, I, if I had my pick, I'd go for, I'd go for something nice. Sweet. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for jumping on the podcast, man. Guys, if you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. I'm going to put a link down in the description below for all you young guys that don't know what Behind the Barriers is. You can just go check that out right now. It'll change your life. Um, You can also go check out Jeremy's social media down in the description below. But other than that, we'll see you next time, guys. Cheers.